Well, here we are again, and moving right along, we present to you Michael T. Young, originally of Reading, Pennsylvania. See, I told you I knew how to do that one. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, he's come to New York since 19, in 1990 to seek his fortune. Find any? A little bit, but little not bit. enough to quit my job. Ah, well, let's see. Um, he's a very elegant author. He wins uh, prizes. He comes, if, when he doesn't win prizes, he comes in very close to winning prizes. But he's never at the bottom of anybody's list. I think we can safely say that. He was a semi-finalist in the 1992 Discovery uh, the Nation contest. Yep. And did you discover the nation? Uh, no, only a little corner of it up in the upper right-hand side, you know, <laughs> where Maine is. Ah, okay. Well, as Maine goes, so go well, you know the rest of that. <laughs> Uh, let's see, you've been in uh, the Christian Science Monitor, the Holland's Critic uh, Folio, Radapalax, yes, that is the bona fide uh, endorsed pronunciation, as I recall. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of journals. Um, let's see, there's a chapbook, Because the Wind Has Questions, yep. which came out in 1997. I understand it's already sold out? Yeah. I, uh, well, I had maybe two copies left, but... Uh, That's close know, enough. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's close enough. Um, what sort of uh, questions did the wind have? Oh, um, well, actually, it was like, can you play this flute? No. Uh huh. <laughs> and the answer was no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you have a lot of wind up in uh, up in Mount Kisco or North Salem. <laughs> where, well, they're close enough too. All right, how about a poem, Michael? Okay. This is called uh, Autumn in Chelsea. The street seems to unwind as though some loop of thought unthought itself in sudden bravado, then ran, leaving a man to mind his stoop and stare into the absence of his shadow. The street lights, like a mockery of moons, hum in the maples. Taxis stall at corners. The wind staggers. Wide-eyed pedestrians throw dialectic glances over their shoulders. From alley, open window and passing car, gesture and phrase, stammer and fall short. Even the policeman looks back twice. The reasons aren't ever particular. The low half-hearted beatings of the heart can't keep the count, can't tell the time or price. Mm. I noticed the wind was in there too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it shows up in a lot of my poems. Uh -huh. it's, uh, I think one of the reasons I, I like Rutke so much, because ah. he's always mm -hmm. bringing up the wind. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, I'll stick to blow, blow, thou winter's wind. <laughs> All right, how about but, another? Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's called uh, Instructions for Assembling the Dark. Clear the table. Sweep away the clutter. Let the hands quiver under the desk lamp, though only as a symptom of something else of something inarticulate, even, perhaps, unknowable, but always arriving. Yet wait without expecting anything. It won't be easy. Memory and imagination will conjure pasts and futures of exaggerated importance, ghosts invented by the mind at its own expense. Better to turn the lamp off, contemplate the dark, and how I carry it everywhere, like a deep well of black ink inside me trying each time to write it out, and each time translating it from language to language, from tree to morning glory to vagrant wind, from night to day into the very sunshine, the flutter of daylight's images collapsing, not into dreams, but into forgotten dreams, not to atoms, but the spaces between them, voids puncturing the bloodstream like bubbling froth, Waters pushing through rapids where the danger is unavoidable, and fear constricts the throat, confining each scream, yet throwing the voice to the pitch and grace of necessary song. Ominous. Michael, you've convinced me. Tonight I'm sleeping with the lights on. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll bet Elaine will do the same. Oh, well, I have my night lights. <laughs> Always a useful item to have. Oh, yeah. So, how did you get into this poetry racket, anyway? Um, it actually... I was sort of influenced by a library teacher when I was in uh, ninth mm -hmm. grade. Um, mm -hmm. And I wrote a poem for, a, for a, an assignment. It was an optional assignment, and she asked me if I ever considered writing poetry. Mm -hmm. And I had been 
in love with the Tao Te Ching at the time for a long time, mm -hmm. which is, of course, poetry, really. Uh -huh. And uh, I just decided mm -hmm. to take my chance at it, and uh, mm -hmm. I kept getting more and more interested and have stuck with it ever since. Tell us about the Tao Te Ching. The Tao Te Ching, uh, it's... Oh, I was close. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's basically a, a religious text. It's mm -hmm. a, a holy text written by Chuang Tzu, a uh, Chinese philosopher. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a series of, uh, I think, uh, 81 poems, which are very much like uh, Proverbs in the Bible, mm -hmm. um, full of a lot of wonderful wisdom about living well. Mm. Here's the trick question of the evening. Do you remember any of them? Uh, I remember parts and uh, some of my favorites. Ah. Can you give us a little taste? Sure. Just for um, the variety of it all. Uh, the great Tao flows everywhere, to the left and to the right. All things depend upon it to exist, and it does not abandon them. It loves and nourishes all things, and it does not lord it over them. Mm -hmm. Well, drifting to the left and the right sounds like a lot of cab drivers I've had in my time. <laughs> I don't think they just drift. Uh, well, let's switch back to one of yours. Uh, okay. Let's see. This uh, next one is uh, based on a statue by Rodin, which is uh, at the Met, mm -hmm. called uh, Three Shades. Brother standing next to brother, each imitates the other, keeping in step by thrusting his left arm out to his neighbor's reach. Palms down and centered, they almost hold hands. Backs arched, they tilt their heads and nearly prop them in the cup of their neighbor's collarbone. Their bent knees cross a horizontal with their left hands till their leverage slips out from under the fulcrum of their joints, converging on a ledge of contracted width, a ground of being shrunk into a point somewhere between their feet and fingertips. Thus their posture, devoted to a purpose beyond themselves, can never be explained. And even though everyone wonders what contorts their grace into this tortured pose, since no one's admitted into their intimate circle, everyone retreats from their pain. And only then, by allowing a space for them to suffer their invisible burden, do their converging backs reveal the horizon, the hills into which they've buried their heads to escape the light and enter a peace that holds no consequences for their deeds. All that in a sculpture. All that in a sculpture. It was, a, it was one of those epiphanal moments. I was looking at it uh -huh. and stepped back. And if you step back from it and you look at it, their, their shoulders come up above their heads, and it looks like a distant horizon. And uh, that's when I sort of got the idea for it. Mm -hmm. Now, let's see. In your bio, you, you said that your poetry aspires to spread thoughtfulness. Yes. Um, have you achieved that goal? I don't know. That's up to the people who listen. <laughs> I can only I can only try to. Well, do I'll it. think about it. Um, <laughs> so, what's the most thoughtful thing that ever happened to you? The most in thoughtful poetry? thing. Ooh, that's a s strange question. <laughs> I would say that perhaps one of the most encouraging things that has happened to me is uh, after reciting a poem at a reading uh, called "Dad." The poem was called "Dad." Right. Mm -hmm. um, a fellow poet uh, later told me how this poem had influenced a friend of hers, mm -hmm. um, that she hadn't spoken to her father in seven years. And after hearing my poem, she wrote her own poem mm -hmm. and called her father and talked to him for the first time in uh, seven years. That is thoughtful. Uh, I'm always glad to hear a case where poetry is actually doing some good yeah. uh, for people, rather than uh, so many people were running around going, look at me, I'm a poet. <laughs> Exactly. I, I think when I heard that, that was when I said, this is what it's about. Mm, that's great. Um, let's get another one in. Okay. This is uh, called From a Hotel Room in Florence. Um, the, cathe the cathedral mentioned here, Santa Maria del Fiore, is, mm -hmm. uh, if you've seen a picture of Florence or you've been there, this is the most prominent building there. Uh, uh -huh. It's a beautiful cathedral. So this is Italy rather than South Carolina. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> From a hotel room in Florence. The cathedral and the baptistry of Santa Maria del Fiore loom luminous beyond the window, having captured the sunlight now for hours, deep in their arabesques 
and deeper in their marble tiles, as if they were a beaker and flask in which our failed efforts distill to lace their facades with these greens and whites, these gold mosaics and their story, our story, the way it is, long nights, constant losses, the pain and worry, and pigeons circling the piazza, or in the crenulation, perching, like angels grown a little lazy from centuries of waiting and watching. Mm, pigeons, always pigeons. Even there, and especially all over Venice. Mm -hmm. and do you have any unfulfilled ambitions? Don't we all? <laughs> well, sure, but uh, nothing I can talk about on the air. <coughs> Only, I guess, uh, in poetic terms, uh, mm -hmm. there are always new forms uh, to write in. It would be wonderful, mm -hmm. I think, to write a, ver a successful long poem. It's very difficult to pull off a successful long poem. Uh-huh. Well, what is a hong poem? A long oh, poem. A long, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, how long would you like to go? Um... Because we are running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't even have many. Mm -hmm. But uh, even for me, I mean, a long poem for me is 10 to 15 pages. Mm -hmm. And uh, Have you dabbled in form? Oh, dabbled? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, many forms. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Dad was a, a triolet. That was my mm -hmm. first triolet poem. All right. Let's get a small one in if we can. <laughs> um, let me pull out. The last small one here, I'll pick up. Where are they? Here's a small one. Mm -hmm. Oyster shells. Rolling a pearl on her tongue, she calls my name. Moments sail by moments to years. Break over coral. Gathering sand beads drain down a vortex of the fish's wake. Yet haunting this beach, a rich return, these shells keep something to themselves, a diver's story, urging the timid on to brave the swells, where love is a confession of the sea. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to keep my oyster shells from now on instead of getting the deposit. Um, <laughs> do you have any quick advice for someone like Elaine here? Uh, Hi. <laughs> read a lot <laughs> and uh, study another language. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Well, since you bring it up, how many have you studied? <laughs> One. Just German. Ah. I have enough trouble with English myself. <laughs> hey, don't we all? Do you, ever, <laughs> do you ever get the temptation to write in German? Um, I did try that. Um, mm -hmm. It's, I mean, of course, it was very clunky and very juvenile, of course, because mm. just learning another language is, it takes so long to put yourself into the mind frame. Mm -hmm. uh, but forcing yourself to do that and knowing the differences of structure and things like that enlighten you to your own immensely. Yeah, and then all of a sudden you can't use your favorite idioms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because they don't translate. Yeah. Mm. Well. I, I seem to recall when I, when I actually took a semester of German in high school and I seem to recall that some of the words started over here and sort of ended up over there. Yeah, you split the verbs. Uh, among other things. Anyway, Michael T. Young, I want to thank you for coming on Poet to Poet. Also, thank you. Thank you again, Elaine Poon. Thank you. And thank you for watching, because that's the most important thing of all. And we'll see you soon.